CCP officials have begun locking down individual houses as virus outbreaks worsen in Xinjiang. Also, the CCP is being accused of launching cyber espionage attacks against the Vatican and other Catholic organizations. And Google is being accused of aiding the Chinese military, even after canceling a program with the U.S. military. Welcome back, everyone. First off, some breaking news. The Chinese Communist Party has upgraded its systems of control in Xinjiang, where cities are now being placed on lockdown amid new virus outbreaks of the new coronavirus, also known as the CCP virus. In Urumqi City, Chinese officials are not only locking down residential communities, but have even begun locking down individual houses. Authorities used loudspeakers to warn residents to not leave their homes and declared, quote, legs will be broken if they leave the house. Teeth will be knocked out if they resist. Now the situation overall in Urumqi has become more strict. The Urumqi Epidemic Prevention and Control Work Headquarters upgraded and adjusted the control measures for people entering or leaving Urumqi. It has new systems to control people arriving in the city. And people coming in from high-risk areas are required now to have 14 days of concentrated medical observation. Now, for people who are not Urumqi residents but want to enter Urumqi, starting on July 17, they made it so that anyone who has previously stayed in the city for more than 14 days is required to have a Xinjiang health code, as well as official green code health clearance, or they cannot return. Now, when it comes to these different codes, the Chinese Communist Party has health codes tied to your smartphone. Your smartphone's tied to your social security number and other data tied to you. And so there are different health codes. A green code means you can travel freely. They will also need to show negative virus test results within seven days of returning to Urumqi. Now, despite these strict measures, it appears Chinese authorities are struggling to contain the virus outbreaks in several regions of Xinjiang. Dilshat Reshet, spokesman of the World Uyghur Congress, an international organization of exiled Uyghurs, told the Chinese language Epoch Times on July 30 that the group heard from local residents in the area who believed authorities were underreporting the outbreak. And meanwhile, in Dalian, which has also been placed on lockdown for the virus, the outbreak appears to be growing worse. On July 30th, a shopping plaza in Dalian was temporarily closed. A local man's virus test came in positive while he was shopping at the plaza, and authorities closed the entire mall down. CCP officials then order a mass nucleic acid testing for all staff working in the mall, and the process continued until 10 p.m. that night. Now, we've seen the same incident take place in other parts of China as well when it comes to these malls. In other news, five Indian soldiers were killed in an ambush by what local reports claim were suspected militants with the Chinese regime's People's Liberation Army. NDTV, a local media, reported that the killed soldiers are part of a squad of 15 Assam rifle soldiers who were in Manipur near the border with Myanmar. They were first hit with an improvised explosive device, then by rifle fire and a grenade launcher. Now, based on the reports, it's unclear whether the attackers were directly with the Chinese military. As a bit of context on this, the Myanmar military recently criticized the Chinese regime for backing communist terrorist groups in the country. Captured weapons caches from the militants are often found to have originated in China. In other news, a former lieutenant colonel with the Chinese regime's naval command is saying that the CCP will end if it goes to war in the South China Sea. Now, based on his experience and observations, Yao Cheng said that the CCP's military is far less powerful than the United States, and noted if the two sides confronted each other in the South China Sea, it would be a battle of navies and air forces. He said, quote, China's naval and air forces are not as powerful as the U.S. militaries. It is estimated that within a day, the U.S. F-35 fighter jets can destroy the CCP's naval and air forces. And although the war may be confined to the South China Sea in this regard, Yao Cheng said that China's other border conflicts are also severe, such as the Sino-Indian border disputes and the long-term suppression of Uyghurs in Xinjiang and of Tibetans, of course, in Tibet by the Chinese Communist Party. Now, if a war were really triggered in the South China Sea, he said the Chinese Communist Party would risk not only a battle in that area, but also battles in its other border regions. And he noted the possibility of a military confrontation is not low. 
Meanwhile, the United States approved a $126 million sale of armed assault boats to the Philippines, which is also involved in border disputes with the CCP in the South China Sea. And Russia is also showing signs of breaking from the Chinese regime. Late last week, several Chinese news sources reported that the Kremlin indefinitely postponed all deliveries of its S-400 missile defense systems to the Chinese regime's military, which is the People's Liberation Army. Now, the Chinese news outlet Sohu reported that Russia stopped the sale for, quote, the sake of China. Now, the statement contradicts the CCP's own actions, however. Even amid the virus outbreaks and natural disasters in China, the regime has not stopped its efforts for military expansion and has also not slowed down its campaigns against nearby countries in its border disputes. And while Russia has stopped its deliveries of the S-400 systems to China, it is speeding up its deliveries of the same missile defense systems to India. And in addition to this, Russia has accused one of its top Arctic scientists, Valery Mitko, for spying for China. And in Hong Kong, meanwhile, Hong Kong Chief Executive Carrie Lam has postponed the upcoming elections for the Legislative Council for another year, and she's citing the virus outbreaks. This is being interpreted by pro-democracy activists as a power grab by authorities and is being seen in context of the CCP's further expanding its control over Hong Kong. And around the same time, the Hong Kong government disqualified 12 pro-democracy candidates, including Joshua Wong, from running in the upcoming elections. Now, the candidates shared the notifications they received from the government on their Facebook pages. And Wong wrote on Twitter, quote, Clearly, Beijing shows a total disregard for the will of Hong Kongers, tramples upon the city's last pillar of vanishing autonomy, and attempts to keep Hong Kong's legislature under its firm grip. Even government censor me out from ballot. They can't censor my qualification to commit it in the democracy movement in Hong Kong. And that's the reason they can't kill us all. Even they try to prosecute us, bar us to run for office and silence our voice, we wish to try our best, lest our voice being heard around the world. Now, in addition to this, the new national security force in Hong Kong carried out its first actions in Hong Kong and arrested four students on July 29. The new force was created under the CCP's new national security laws, which force mainland law on Hong Kong ending its former agreement on autonomy from the CCP. Now, these four students are being charged for posting, quote, problematic messages on social media that promoted things like, you know, in the CCP's terms, separatism and incited pro-independence activities. Their phones, computers, and files were confiscated by police. Hong Kong Police Senior Superintendent Lee Kwai Wah said during a press conference, quote, don't think that if you're on social media, you don't need to be responsible. Now, these arrests were made using the CCP's different phrasing. The Chinese Communist Party has different ways of using language to alter the perception of its laws. What does it mean to, quote, promote separatism? In Hong Kong and in Taiwan and, for example, Xinjiang or Tibet, if you talk about Hong Kong independence or Hong Kong democracy, you are promoting separatism. If you talk about, in Taiwan, Taiwan being its own country, you are promoting separatism. If you talk about the rights of Tibetans or Muslim Uyghurs, you're promoting separatism. It means doing anything that goes against the Chinese Communist Party's different claims over these regions. What does it mean to, quote, incite pro-independence activities? Again, that's a play on the exact same idea. It means that in addition to promoting separatism, people went out and protested or made statements, you know, in response, for example, to what you posted. And what are, quote, problematic messages? Problematic messages under the CCP is any statement that the CCP would view as offensive or as a challenge to its authority. And so again now, the Chinese Communist Party is interfering with the Hong Kong elections. The Chinese Communist Party is restricting who can even run in their elections. And at the same time, it's arresting people, normal Hong Kong citizens, who are making statements on social media that it sees as a challenge to its own powers. And in other news, the Chinese Communist Party's use of religious believers and political prisoners as living sources for organ transplants is making headlines again. The World Health Organization came out to promote, that's the WHO again, came out to promote the CCP's organ transplant program. And this drew quick criticism, however, as the regime has been exposed for its state-run murder-for-profit programs. 
Now, a China tribunal in the UK concluded in mid-2019 that the Chinese regime is, quote, beyond a reasonable doubt, illegally killing people for the organ trade, and declared the main group being targeted in these state killings are practitioners of Falun Gong. Activist groups are also now calling for investigations into claims the Chinese Communist Party has also been using ethnic Uyghurs in its campaigns of forcible organ harvesting. And now for the broader stories for today. First stop, the CCP is being accused of launching cyber espionage attacks against the Vatican, the Catholic Diocese of Hong Kong, and other organizations related to the Catholic Church. Now, these attacks come just ahead of an expected September renewal of the 2018 China-Vatican Provisional Agreement. Now, the attacks, which began in early May 2020, were detailed in a report by security intelligence company Recorded Future. It says the attacks were launched by a Chinese state-sponsored group that they've dubbed Red Delta that had already been tracked by security researchers as well. It states, quote, the suspected intrusion into the Vatican would offer Red Delta insight into the negotiating positions of the Holy See ahead of the deal's September 2020 renewal. Now, the 2018 agreement that they're talking about here was signed between the CCP and the Vatican and allowed the Chinese authorities to appoint bishops in China. The move was seen as a blow to Catholics in China, though, who refused to follow the CCP's version of their religion and has also been accused of making the situation for Catholics in the country worse. After the deal was passed, the body representing the CCP-approved version of the religion, the Catholic Church in China, issued a statement saying it would, quote, persevere to walk a path suited to a socialist society under the leadership of the Chinese Communist Party. Now, what are we seeing here? Now, first off, cyber attacks like this are not unusual when it comes to the Chinese Communist Party, whether it's cyber attacks against religions such as the Uyghurs, Tibetans, Falun Gong practitioners, and so on. They do it to all of them. But in this case, this also has other implications because the cyber attacks also appear to be getting information for an upcoming negotiation they're planning. And that is also not uncommon for the Chinese Communist Party either. If they can get insights into the different issues that the Vatican is concerned about, the way it views the different policies within China, and the way they've affected the Christian and Catholic communities, this could actually impact that quite a bit. And also notably, some of the organizations they've targeted for these cyber attacks include Catholic bodies in Hong Kong. And so it's very likely that the CCP wants to get an idea of how the Catholic Church is viewing the CCP's policies in Hong Kong. And also this demonstrates the Chinese Communist Party's distrust of the Vatican, despite having signed this deal. Meanwhile, a ranking member of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, Asia Subcommittee, has introduced a new act that would help strengthen the U.S. commitment that would help strengthen the commitment of the United States to defend Taiwan in the case of an attack from mainland China. Now, Florida Congressman Ted Yoho introduced the Taiwan Invasion Prevention Act on July 29 and said in a statement that the CCP's military, the People's Liberation Army, or the PLA, has been building up and is increasing hostile actions in the Taiwan Strait. And this, along with direct threats from the CCP, quote, make their intentions toward Taiwan abundantly clear. Now, he stated, quote, the United States must act immediately to establish a clear red line over Taiwan that must not be crossed by China. As a vibrant democracy with nearly 24 million people, the U.S. is obligated to stand strong in support of Taiwan and encourage a return to peaceful relations between Taiwan and China. Now, this act would establish a limited defense authorization for the U.S. president to use the military to secure or protect Taiwan from an attack. It would require the CCP to end its use and threats of military force when dealing with Taiwan, would establish dialogues and military exercises between the United States and Taiwan and other security partners, and would advance various forms of cooperation with Taiwan, including in defense and with a trade agreement. And so when it comes to this, the United States may be re-establishing its commitment to defend Taiwan in a much stronger way than before. Now, the U.S. already had similar agreements to this, but they were kind of toothless in many regards. The CCP openly has many aggressive different forms of military preparations and propaganda and public statements targeting Taiwan. They, for example, have a replica of the Taiwanese presidential palace at one of their military bases, and they run exercises on invasions on Taiwan. The CCP regularly makes incursions into Taiwan airspace with its jets and has other aggressive maneuvers targeting Taiwan. 
the U.S. has largely been pretty much silent on this for a long time, other than, for example, with this freedom of navigation operations that the U.S. is doing. And on that note, too, the Trump administration recently held one, bringing U.S. aircraft carriers through the Taiwanese Strait. And so again, the U.S. does appear to be standing stronger by Taiwan. And if this act were to pass, it would include much stronger relations with Taiwan on many different levels. Meanwhile, the Trump administration may review TikTok as a potential channel for the Chinese Communist Party to interfere in the 2020 U.S. elections. A group of six Republican senators, including Ted Cruz, Tom Cotton, and Marco Rubio, issued an open letter on July 28 to Director of National Intelligence John Ratcliffe, FBI Director Christopher Wray, and Acting Secretary of Homeland Security Chad Wolf, expressing their concern that the CCP may be able to use TikTok in influence operations against the United States, including, as they state, quote, operations designed to interfere in our elections. Now, President Donald Trump also commented the following day on July 29th and said this, quote, we're looking at TikTok. We're thinking about making a decision. And U.S. Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin said, according to the Epoch Times, that TikTok is currently under federal review by the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States, or CFIUS, which looks into national security risks in foreign deals. Now, the Chinese regime's spokesperson for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Wang Wenbin, responded to the allegations and said the CCP doesn't intend to meddle in the U.S. elections. Then Wang said, quote, the Chinese government always asks Chinese companies to comply with law and regulations when conducting economic cooperation with foreign countries. Now, other than the fact that many of these Chinese companies directly engage in economic theft against the United States, now his statement was quick to draw comments, however, because Wang stated that TikTok is a Chinese company, something the company itself denies. What are we seeing here? Chinese companies are required to follow Chinese law. Yes, Wong said they follow the laws in the different countries they're in, but previous experiences and evidence has shown otherwise. Many Chinese companies openly do economic theft against the United States, have been charged for doing economic theft against the United States, for running spy operations against the United States, and doing very similar things. They very regularly violate foreign law. But he's saying that uh, on this note that TikTok, for example, does not steal data from Americans and is not being used for, say, political warfare operations. But TikTok has been exposed, censoring users for criticisms of the CCP, for promoting posts that seem to favor pro-CCP and anti-American issues, and for keylogging users, for example, spying on them. And the company is also owned by ByteDance, this big Chinese company. And the head of ByteDance, a year before TikTok became popular, came out openly and wrote a self-criticism letter apologizing to the Chinese Communist Party for not closely following its different guidelines when it comes to being used for propaganda and other measures. He promised that he would use his company to support the CCP's different initiatives, including around propaganda. And on the note of TikTok, Japanese lawmakers in the ruling Liberal Democratic Party are pushing for government restrictions on TikTok under concerns the CCP may use it to collect data on Japanese citizens. Now, Japan appears to be following the U.S. lead on this. It's something we're probably going to be seeing more and more of with countries standing up against the Chinese Communist Party. But also, notably, India was the first country to ban TikTok and has so far taken the strongest stance against TikTok. And this also shows unity in the new Quad Alliance between the United States, India, Japan, and Australia when it comes again to standing up against the Chinese Communist Party. Now the news, the CEOs of Facebook, Google, Amazon, and Apple testified before the U.S. House Judiciary Subcommittee on Antitrust, Commercial, and Administrative Law. The hearing is part of a year-long congressional investigation into these companies allegedly using anti-competitive tactics, stifling innovation, and for other issues, and is addressing whether antitrust laws should be used against them. Now, among the criticisms against these companies was from Representative Matt Gates, who called out Google for dropping an AI project that could have helped U.S. troops, but kept similar programs for the CCP that could also benefit the Chinese military. Now, Google pulled out of the U.S. program known as Project Maven after thousands of its employees signed a petition calling for Google to end its involvement in the program in June 2018. But despite this, Google kept similar programs with the CCP, including to develop capabilities for its fifth-generation J-20 fighter jet. 
Now, Gates said this. You collaborate with Chinese universities that take millions upon millions of dollars from the Chinese military. And he continued noting Google was criticized by General Dunford for, quote, directly aiding the Chinese military and also added. Peter Thiel, who actually serves on Mr. Zuckerberg's board at Facebook, book, said that Google's activities with China are treasonous. He accused you of treason. So why would an American company with American values so directly aid the Chinese military but have ethical concerns about working alongside the U.S. military on Project Maven? And he further questioned them by saying, And if you have no problem making the J-20 Chinese fighter more effective in its targeting, why, why wouldn't you want to make America as effective? Now, Google CEO Sundar Pichai responded over teleconference stating this. Congressman, uh, with respect, uh, we are not working with uh, the Chinese military. It's absolutely false. I had a chance to meet with General Dunford personally. Of course, what Google was accused of was not working directly with the Chinese military, but instead working with a Chinese university that is developing technologies for the Chinese military. Now, Pichai added something interesting, however. He said this. We have clarified what we, do in, what we do in China compared to our peers. It's very, very limited in nature. Now, what are we seeing here? Again, he said, compared to our peers is very minimal. What does it mean for other companies doing business in China? What does it mean to Google's peers on that note? Now, Western companies are being called out now for their projects with the Chinese Communist Party. We see this in many different regards. When it comes, for example, to Western companies being involved in slave labor in different parts of China, such as Xinjiang. Now, many Western companies are being called out for their involvement in different projects with the Chinese Communist Party that, for example, support its military, violate human rights issues, or, for example, advance the interests of the CCP over different countries. We can look, for example, to different cases of the apparel industry, of car manufacturers, of different companies right now directly involved or indirectly involved in slave labor in Xinjiang. When the Chinese Communist Party has been sanctioned, CCP officials and businesses have been sanctioned for using slave labor, many Western companies have also been exposed in that. What does that mean for these companies going forward? Could they also be held liable? If it turns out, for example, that they went into those markets knowing that slave labor was taking place at those different facilities. And when it comes, for example, to this case of projects involving the Chinese military, research projects or otherwise, what does that mean for these companies? Now, this raises the question of liability of doing research or even manufacturing in China. What is the liability of being involved in projects like this in China? How can companies actually know what it will be the final use of the things they're developing. One issue you have, for example, when it comes to military equipment is dual-use technology. Sometimes it can be used for products and military equipment at the same time. And also this is going to bring up something interesting. When does the cost outweigh the gain of keeping projects in China? When does it become more profitable for these companies to move their factories to India, Vietnam, or other countries? When does it become, say, too risky for companies like Google to get involved in research projects with Chinese universities that may, for example, be receiving finances from the Chinese military? What does this mean for these companies going forward? Now, with that said, folks, we're broadcasting five days a week, Monday through Friday. And also, if you want to support us, please join us on Patreon. The link is in the description below. And if you haven't already, please don't forget to like and subscribe. Again, it really helps this channel grow. And again, if you want to go the extra mile, please tell a friend or family member about Crossroads. That said, please take care of yourselves, stay healthy, and stay free. Mm -hmm.